Good evening, I'm Robert Keston, the new executive director here at Stonewall National Museum and Archives. And today we'll be talking to Frida Kahlo, of, an original founder of the Gorilla Girls. But first I just wanna thank everybody who was here. Thank Hunter, the former executive for starting this program, which has brought a lot of in interesting people and interesting topics to those who participate in this Stonewall um, effort. And uh, I'm hoping that uh, many of you that are here, whether for the first time or as a repeat customer, uh, will consider becoming members of Stonewall. Uh, Stonewall has one of the most unique archives of the LGBTQ plus community in the world, certainly here in the United States, and one of the largest libraries. And we want to continue to maintain those important educational, informational, and entertaining uh, collections so that history will continue to equal pride. And also today is the first day of pride. So we are very excited here uh, because what is most interesting about pride and about the LGBTQ plus community is that it's one of the few communities that actually represents everybody. There's not one country, what, not one city, not one town, not one village, probably not one family that doesn't have someone who's a member of this community. So it, pride is a real opportunity for us all to come together and not only come together, but build alliances that will get us through the hard times and make the good times even better. So please take a moment, join up, participate in our programming nationally, locally, wherever you are, we are there for you and we hope that you will join us. So now you can see the slide. Uh, this is, all comes from the Gorilla Girls, The Art of Behaving Badly, which I'm not gonna be able to show the whole thing, but I will show as much as I can. Uh, this is a group that's been around for quite some time and has literally by behaving badly forced us to think about things that under normal circumstances we might not. Like how many women are represented in galleries or in museums? How many people of color are represented in museums or galleries? And it's really one of those things that often slips under the radar because we just don't pay attention. And when we don't pay attention, we end up hurting all of ourselves because we're missing such an important voice. And that is the voice of our fellow human beings. So Frida, what is it about this picture that got it included in your book? Well, this is just a collage that we, uh, you know, that we use as a kind of intro uh, to our work. And it, it shows you a little bit of everything that we've done. Um, I'd like to advance to the, to the first slide because it's great to be here and it's great to know about the archive. And thank you so much for um, inviting us. I feel so honored to be the first guest during Pride Month. So thank you very much. And it made me go back and think about our work. We started in 1985 and we were just a bunch of, you know, women of all, you know, of all um, sexual orientations, of all colors, uh, ethnicities. We were, in some ways we were ahead of ourselves. Um, and we had this idea of, of feminism that was actually there, you know, we found a word to uh, describe it and it was intersectional. We, um, just because our group was so varied that we sort of started to look at the art world in all kinds of different ways, each, you know, each member of our group from her own unique perspective. And um, I went through and found some projects that uh, represent, you know, the, the voice of the gay community. Here's something we did back in 1989. And I don't know whether your listeners remember Jesse Helms, but he was the guy who um, attacked uh, the Robert Maplethorpe exhibition and you know, was behind the, the kind of demise of the, uh, of the National Endowment for the Arts. So um, we thought, wouldn't it be interesting to look at the art world um, in a new way and to see all the ways in which the art world was really conventional 
and conservative and a little bit reactionary. So we decided to tell him that, you know, the art world really was his kind of place. So we started to list all the reasons. The number of blacks at an art opening is about the same as at one of your garden parties. Um, uh, let's see, because aesthetic quality stands above all, there's never been a need for affirmative action in museums and galleries. I mean, this of course is satirical, <laughs> these things where they're horrible when you think about it. You know, most art collectors, like most successful artists, are white males. And I mean, think, you know, just think about what that means. Um, museums are separate but equal. <laughs> no female black painter or sculptor has been in a Whitney Biennial since 1973. Instead, they can show at the Studio Museum in Harlem or the Women's Museum in Washington. And then getting down there, uh, down the list, the sexual imagery in most respected works of art is the expression of wholesome heterosexual males. Um, so we never really thought of these uh, problems in separate ways, even though we did do projects that did focus on, you know, on black females in galleries um, and the lack of representation of women in the history of art. But we really sort of jammed them all together and indicted the art world on almost every different direction you could. And the word intersectional existed at that point, but it was a kind of theoretical world word. It hadn't really worked its way into, uh, you know, into the mainstream the way it is now. But anyway, this was done in 1989. And then, um, we decided when Clarence Thomas was being, um, um, when there were hearings to approve him as a Supreme Court justice, we thought it was kind of interesting because when he was attacked for um, sexual harassment, he, you know, he came back and said, you know, what goes on in my life is absolutely private. He claimed all this privacy. But then he opposed, he opposed gay rights. So we wanted to take him at his word and declare to the world that he does support the right to privacy for gays and lesbians because he claimed that his sex life was his own business. Um, and that one was that one was done in um, 1992. So so a big part of the work and the work that I remember from all the way back to when you started, uh, one points out hypocrisy and two, it has a lot of tongue in cheek. So there is a lot of humor in this very brash, very uh, almost aggressive uh, way of calling people out and not only calling the art world out, but calling society out in general. I mean, uh, certainly Thomas had nothing to do with the art world, but at the same time, his positions certainly impacted every single American. Yeah, absolutely. And um, well, we, we found out, I mean, humor is a great way of attacking those in power. You know, it's really punching up. It's not punching down, um, which is the great power of political humor to punch up um, and to make fun of someone who has power over you. In some cases, it's your only weapon. And uh, not only did it make us feel stronger, uh, but it did make all of the people in power a little nervous. No one wanted in the art world wanted to be on one of our posters. Uh, they would kind of cringe when the new posters came out. Um, what would you say? What would you say is the most effective campaign that you ever ran? Oh, I don't know. It depends on you know uh, what side of the bed I wake up in the morning. I really don't <laughs> think in that kind of hierarchy. Uh, you know, it, it, some days something seemed really stupid to me. <laughs> Other days it seems kind of great. So I really don't know. I mean, we're focused on things that we're doing now. And we're, we did finish this project, which will go up in Miami uh, about uh, the prison situation in Florida, how um, kind of disastrous it is when you look at the, uh, at the figures um, and how Florida in the country ranks pretty low in terms of, of um, the way incarcerated individuals are treated and especially poor and black uh, and, and uh, incarcerated individuals of color. Uh, so that's, that's my focus right now. So I, I'm, I'm sorry I can't answer that question, but what's yours? <laughs> uh, 
I, I, I like them all. I particularly like the the ones that recounted how many artists were shown by the major galleries in New York. <laughs> well, uh, I think you know. no one no one really criticized um, the financial structure of the art world. You know, it, it's um, there are many people who are interested in art and many, many people who make art, but the tastemakers uh, are, are oftentimes people who really don't know anything about art, but just have a lot of money and they want to throw it at something that they think is important. So um, I think we're living in a kind of gilded age where, you know, our culture is being, uh, you know, is being determined and written uh, by wealth and art has become an instrument of, uh, of investment. And uh, that's not the real history of art. That's just the history of wealth and power. Although wealth dating back to even before the popes played a, a big role in, in art and who was considered in, an important artist. So I don't think that it's unique to this time, but I do agree that uh, the determination of quality is determined on who buys your work more than your contribution to the history and narrative of, of art. But you know, we're living in what we hope is a democratic age. And a lot of European art, you know, is identified with kings and queens and popes and aristocrats and emperors and czars and whatever. We live in a different time. And we shouldn't let um, the most wealthy and privileged members of our society tell us what our culture is. There has always been popular culture, there's always been material culture, and if you look at many non-European cultures, they have a completely different, you know. Absolutely. So uh, I, I, I hope, I'm always hoping that the world is getting better, although I have to say the last two years has been a real setback in many, many ways, but I'm hoping that the world gets better and better, and the more we think about art, the more we're going to attack the sort of stagnant, regressive uh, aspects of the art world and really uh, demand that our institutions show, you know, the whole range of what artists do, not just the artists that billionaires collect. Anyway, and, I'm getting a little off the point. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but not off the point of, of the work that you all have done. Uh, in, in pointing all of these things out. Right. Well, let's go on and, to the next one. Yeah. Sure. I'm sorry. You can, well, I interrupted you. No, go ahead. Please go ahead. Uh, well, back in 1992, there were, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of the far right was using this idea of natural law to sort of um, attack progressive ideas and, and social change. So we decided that we would do a project to explain the concept of natural law. And um, things like uh, protecting the rights of the unborn means precisely that. Once you're born, you're on your own. And of course, that was uh, the attack on abortion rights. Sexual harassment is a man's natural response to a woman on the job. Women who report it are uptight prudes. Women who don't are ambitious whores. That was basically saying that you know, women <laughs> didn't, know, didn't know what to do. Um, anyway, let's go on. Uh, the people who have the most money are entitled to the best health care. And then AIDS, and this was really the time of the AIDS epidemic, AIDS is a punishment for homosexuality and drug abuse. Only heterosexual celebrities and children deserve a cure. And that was the, the anger and the um, just the, you know, the cruelty of, of the Reagan administration when it came to developing or supporting or even mentioning, you know, AIDS and, and looking for, uh, you know, a cure. Well, isn't it, it sort of ironic then that uh, Ronald Reagan as president during this crisis never said those words <laughs> right. and that now um, in Florida and in other states, there is an effort to ban the word gay uh, in schools and in, L and in workplaces and uh, the attacks on the transgender community um, almost to try to make them invisible once again. So I think the correlations between periods, political periods 
uh, are very much alive today. And we can see from the historical record where we are today and, and how little we've learned in certain respects. And yet you are able to point out that groups such as yours using art, using um, the tools of communication were always there and we really need to pay better attention so that we don't continue to recycle the worst of us, but recycle the best of us. Well, you know, I'm here I am sitting in New York State, which is, you know, a very accepting state in many, many ways. So I'm curious to know what you, Robert, and, and your colleagues are going to do in Florida. Do you have a game plan? I mean, how are you going to deal with this, you know, this repressive law? Well, the, there's more than one law. Um, so it's really, um, a, a, in a sense, a political campaign to reelect the governor uh, where culture wars are, are the tools. So it's, it's an interesting conundrum. And what the public can do best is obviously go and get involved. Um, whether they get involved in the politics or the policies, but they have to get involved. They have to know what's going on. So what you help do in the work that you do is inform. And to a large extent, that's what we do. We take the historical record out of archives that date back to many years and use that to bring alive history so that it informs the present. Relevancy is vitally important. And right now for us, history equals pride. The more you know about our history, the more pride you can feel about where we have come from and where we plan to go. And that sense of energy and that engagement is really the, the tool for ultimately defeating prejudice and hate that is right now rampant in parts of the United States and certainly in other parts of the world. Well, just tell me there's, there's serious um, opposition to what's going on in Florida. I mean, I, I just can't imagine what it must be like to be a school teacher in Florida right now, trying to figure out what to say to children. It is, it is definitely frightening for teachers. It's frightening for parents, but there is definitely organized efforts. There are court cases, there are groups and organizations that are taking the lead. And there is no problem with getting people to rally in support of human rights and social rights and social justice. So I think that uh, ultimately people will get riled up enough and really make the positive change that's necessary. And we at Stonewall uh, are, are definitely a key player in that because we have literally a, a big, big room filled with everything that shows what happens when you don't get involved and don't get energized. And so I, I do believe that our push in conjunction with the other things that are going on will make a fundamental difference. And with people like you doing the kinds of things that you're doing, we complement each other and push things forward. So whether it's in Texas, whether it's in Florida, whether it's in Alabama, uh, we all have to work together. And I'm hoping more than anything that Pride Month, which starts today, uh, will be the catalyst for building those alliances between the LGBTQ community, the religious community, the straight community, uh, every community, because every community ultimately has friends, relatives, worker, co-workers, neighbors, that are a part of this community. Uh, are you gonna have any great parades? There will be parades everywhere. Woo! Here, is, he, here there will be parades. Um, in New York, you'll have your parade. Um, in Texas, there will be parades. Parades will be there. Pride right. will be there. My hope is that people who have never gone to Pride will go 
not only because it's fun, not only because it's entertaining, but because it's the right thing to do. Wow. Well, you know, I'm looking forward to that. I'm way, way upstate and uh, I have to travel quite a distance to go to a pride parade, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. <laughs> um, there are parades in, in, in Westchester, in Rockland, in uh, probably in Albany. So there are parades, you know, even throughout the more rural and, and less congested parts of New York. Well, actually, I'm probably going to go to the pride uh, parade in Saranac Lake, New York. See? <laughs> anyway, uh, let's let's just go on. This is something that we did in uh, 1995 because uh, once multiculturalism became kind of a buzzword in the art world, a lot of institutions were like rushing to catch up and to be more multicultural than the next. But what they were doing was instead of showing the, the sort of vast diversity, you know, of, uh, of the of gay artists and women artists, they would choose one or two artists to show over and over again and make them geniuses. Um, and we <laughs> thought, well, that's a, it's kind of a, a token, you know, treating them as a token. So we wanted to ask the question um, is, and, and of course, once they, sh you know, they showed a woman artist or a black artist or a gay or a trans artist, then they would think that the problem is taken care of. So we wanted to make fun of the idea of tokenism. So we decided to, <laughs> this is actually a little bit before David Letterman, um, top, top 10 signs that you're an art world token. And then of course your busiest months are February, March, April, June, and September. At parties and openings, the only other people of color are serving you the drinks. Everybody knows your race, gender, and sexual orientation, even when they don't know your work. Um, on and on, let's see. Uh, whenever you open your mouth, it's assumed that you speak for your people, not for yourself. And then at parties, uh, everyone ends up telling you their interracial and gay sexual fantasies, blah, blah, blah. These were all things that happened to members of our group. Um, and um, it's it's sort of uh, this is something that has has a microaggression for you know for every group, um, every diverse group there is. And then fast forwarding to um, 2012, we were invited by um, a group of uh, public uh, art um, administrators to do a billboard uh, in Minneapolis when. Um, they were having a marriage discrimination amendment. They were actually, you know, voting on on whether to um, whether to approve um, same sex marriage. And uh, of course, Michelle Bachman was someone who opposed it. She really, uh, I believe, her husband was one of those pray the gay away um, uh, counselors. Uh, but we did find, like Clarence Thomas, that she made a statement that. Uh, that we could use to proclaim that she actually uh, supports, you know, gay marriage. Uh, we all have the same civil rights. So we decided to do a big billboard that was outside the baseball or the football stadium in Minneapolis, saying even Michelle Bachman believes we all have the same rights. And then we used her face as a way of, um, uh, of, in a way, encouraging people to vote no. Uh, you know, on the um, marriage discrimination amendment. So, and I'm happy to say that um, it did not pass. And uh, you know, you know, gay marriage was uh, was legal in Minneapolis and Minnesota. And then fast forward to the you know the the fateful um, 2016 election. And what we decided to do was think about, and, and, and this is a little scary because, you know, this was done in 2016 and we really didn't have any idea how bad it was going to be once Trump was in office. So we thought, well, um, let's just imagine how he would rename all those commemorative months. And um, well, was and now is African-American History Month, Ku Klux Klan Month, Women's History Month, Locker Room Talk Month, Immigration Awareness Month, Extreme Vetting Month, um, Asian um, American Heritage Month, Internment Camp Heritage Month, LGBTQ Pride Month, Pray the Gay Away Month. Um, I have to say this was funny when we did it, 
But as the years <laughs> went on, it, it all of a sudden became a little too prophetic because um, a lot of this stuff did come down. And it is really scary now how okay it is to express extreme bias and extreme prejudice and extreme bigotry. Um, I never really thought that things would go backwards quite so fast and that so many uh, people with um, you know, racist, sexist, homophobic uh, tendencies would be given so much permission to speak badly in public. And last. Yeah, that's a powerful statement. Yeah. Um, this, this is something we did just last year. Um, and it, it, we sort of recycle a lot of our stuff and bring it up to date. We did this, um, well, this was actually done in 2016. Uh, we took uh, one of the uh, pop quizzes we did early on so like, you know, what happens the rest of the year if you give every, you know, every diverse group who's, who's fighting for rights a month, uh, what happens the rest of the year? Well, you know, discrimination. And I'm happy to say that was just shown um, on the Sunset Strip in Hollywood. And this played continually, continually on Sunset Strip for a number of months. So I guess that's sort of the end of my show and tell. Um, we could go back to that first um, image there. So um, we have always thought of, you know, um, we've always thought of gay rights, trans rights, um, as just part of the mix, you know, none of us are free until everyone is free. And that the only way um, we can fight um, exclusion and prejudice and bias and outright, you know, um, racism and sexism is to all join together and find some kind of a coalition because we're much stronger when we all can stand together and say, you know, no one is free until all of us are free. Uh, you know, our, my rights are not valid until I make sure I'm an ally for someone who is not yet um, uh, granted the, the human rights that they deserve. No, that, that is certainly true. And um, as long as, rights are jeopardized, we all run the risk that our own rights will be jeopardized as well. Human rights are as strong as they make us, protecting them is always fragile. And uh, so, yes, I, I fully agree. Uh, the question is, I guess, um, you, right now you said one of the big campaigns that you're working on is uh, the prisoners, the prison situation in Florida. What are some of the other things that you're working on now? Um, well, I, I, you know, a lot of them are sort of in the in the in the works. We've had a quiet couple of years uh, during COVID because we are usually on the road. Um, probably we make thirty trips a year to various places, um, and and a lot to a lot abroad. Um, we 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 were always kind of surprised at the interest that we you know provoke in, in distant parts of the world. So the last few years have been quiet. So we put together that book um, that you showed, The Art of Behaving Badly, um, and that's kind of a picture book. If you notice, there's no criticism in it. There's no interpretation. There are no essays. We wanted the work to really you know be the star in that book, and, and we figured it you know decided it really didn't need to be explained, it needed to be experienced. So we finished that and we've been working on uh, getting a lot of our work out to exhibitions. Um, we have fully digital exhibitions on different uh, topics. We have a new one that's called uh, 
anti-sexism, anti-racism, and money in the art world. Um, and that really focuses in on the work that we've done about you know, uh, sexism, racism, and money, and how that all, you know, how sexism and racism um, have created an atmosphere of profit, you know, in the art world by identifying certain geniuses and then um, throwing a lot of money at the top of the triangle in the, you know, in the art world. Um, and we're now working on some other crazy things, like uh, we're working on a, uh, a young adult book about, you know, how to make trouble. Um, we're doing a filming for Art 21 uh, in the fall where we're going to take a, a monument. We, we've designed a kind of code of ethics for art museums um, that, you know, say crazy things like, it, it, it's written in biblical language, like thou shalt uh, pay all of your employees a, a decent wage and health insurance because it was a really dark secret of art museums that they pay very, very, very badly. And they sort of for, for generations it depended on people with generational wealth to work in them. Uh, but something about the pandemic really um, was a catalyst for people working in museums to unionize. So that's one of the commandments of the code of ethics. Another is thou shalt not allow um, uh, billionaires who uh, produce uh, addictive drugs, who try to influence uh, museums, who uh, work against, in, you know, in, environment, who work for, who, who cause environmental degradation, should not be allowed to uh, to cleanse their their names on museum walls. Anyway, it's a, it's a very funny, ironic thing. And if uh, any of your viewers go to our website, you can read it. But we're going to make a, a monument and we're going to take it around to these different museums and stand outside in front of the museums and uh, talk to people and see what they think about it and maybe get some people in the art world to begin to think about the ethics in the art world um, and how uh, the fact that there's so much money in the art world now, all the things that come along with money, like money laundering, tax cheating, tax evasion. Um, you know, all kinds of nefarious things that go on in industries that involve a lot of money go on in the art world. And um, a lot of people uh, join museum boards with very nefarious, you know, dark, you know, backgrounds, and they kind of use their, their position on the boards to, to launder their public images. So um, we really want people to know about that, that, you know, our museums are, are um, <clears throat> you know, unlike the museums in Europe, which are all kind of public in most of our museums are private and they're run by art collectors. And that's kind of a conflict of interest right there. So um, we, we want to do that. I mean, we will do that. That's, you know, that's about to happen. And, um, you know, we, we you, you wouldn't believe how much email we get and how many requests we get for press interviews. And we try to do everyone we possibly can in places like Bulgaria, places like um, Brazil, places like Australia. Um, we, we try so what, is, what, are the, what are those countries uh, or people that request you to come? What are they looking for since they don't, as you said, many of their museums are governmental, uh, not private institutions. So what are they looking for from you that is different from what you're doing here in the United States? Well, I think just because the museums are public doesn't mean that they are flexible or that they're progressive. It just means that they, you know, they have a different kind of structure. Uh, when we first started to go to Europe in the 80s, uh, it was really quite behind. I mean, they really didn't question the idea of masterpiece and genius and they had this idea of the mainstream that art went in one single direction. Um, and that has really changed. They started to think about equality and equity and Spain even passed a, an equity law saying that a gender equity law saying that public money had to be equally distributed to uh, female artists as to male artists. Um, but, I mean, even when they have those laws on the book, enforcement is something else. So, I mean, no system alone, you know, can change 
the you know the culture i mean every culture has its little glitches and there's a tyranny in public you know public funded museums too it's not like that's the answer to things but um, we were a kind of voice for just getting up and doing it. Um, I mean, we never had, we didn't ask anyone's permission to do what we did. We just claimed the streets and then we figured out a way to do it cheaply. Um, you know, in a lot of places, they think they have to have funding, you know, to do, to do activism. So um, I think that that's something about our structure that appeals to places who you know, countries where there is public funding for the arts, you know, oftentimes artists don't think of complaining. <laughs> um, uh, did you have role models that spurred you on? Uh, I think every one of us would have, uh, you know, a, a different answer to that. Um, I loved Frida Kahlo. I mean, that's why I took her as a pseudonym. I, you know, I loved how outspoken she was um, and how unimpressed she was by the surrealists and by, uh, you know, the art establishment. Um, I love the way she just sort of mouthed off. Um, I, I also take a lot of interest in comedians, you know, stand-up comedians and also political satire. But um, I think every, you know, every one of our members would answer that question in a different way. And we just got a question from Adrian Rose. Uh, what keeps Guerrilla Girls hopeful and inspired? Because the job is not finished. It's, um, you know, we love the challenge of messaging. Uh, we've always been about transforming people's, changing people's minds. If you look at our work, we rarely, we rarely preach to the choir. We always have wanted to, to tell somebody something they didn't know and to see how that might change their attitude towards the larger picture. You know, a lot of people in the art world back in the 80s really respected the structure of the art world without thinking about how it was constructed. Uh, they never thought about the prejudice. They just all wanted to be in the, you know, in the fanciest galleries and have their museum show, uh, not realizing that the system was set up to, to exclude a lot of people. Um, so we really set about asking big questions about the art world. And we, it gets back to the question of humor. We discovered that if you can make someone laugh who doesn't agree with you, you have a moment inside their brain. And if once you're in there, if you can give them some information or make an argument that might change their mind, you're in a great, I mean, you have a very strategic advantage. And Gary wants to know, how can we inspire young people to become active? This is such a great time for activism. I, um, you know, we've been going to art schools and talking to students since 1985. And it was before there was even an idea of institutional critique or culture jamming. I and mean, we did all that stuff before there was a word for it. Um, and. I'm finding now that that's the kind of stuff that gets taught in art schools, that you can, you can go to art school now and graduate with the idea of doing a social practice and being an activist and, and doing it in a creative way. Um, I, I've, I've never seen that before, let's say the last 10 years. So I'm excited about that. There are a lot of artists um, going to school, a lot of students going to school, really wanting to use their education to make the system better. Um, and in terms of inspiring them, I think just telling them the truth and encouraging them that yes, you can change things. We do, I mean, it seems like we're in a very backward, difficult moment right now because we've gone three steps forward and two steps back. Uh, but that is a challenge. That's an, ex you know, that's an exciting place to be. We have to reclaim, we have to figure out a way to reclaim territory, to reclaim um, consciousness and keep pushing the ball forward. We have to like, keep our eyes on the prize of something better. The world can be a better place if we all decide to work for it. I mean, in everything that we do, if you're a doctor or a lawyer, you know, 
a manufacturer, you know, salesperson, whatever, you know, if your life's work makes the world a better place, you know, you're part of a big movement, a movement bigger than yourself. Um, Adriana Silva wants to know, how has staying anonymous contributed pushing your uh, message forward? Well, I would have had a different answer 30 years ago than I have now, uh, because I think if we were to organize right now, we wouldn't need these stupid masks um, and we wouldn't need the anonymity, uh, but we're kind of stuck with it. Um, when we started, it was self-protective. The art world was a small place and you know, we didn't, we didn't want to, um, we didn't want to jeopardize our careers. We kind of thought that, you know, five years, everything would be fine. We could take these masks off and, you know, and be ourselves. But um, uh, I think what it does is it depersonalizes the, the complaint. You know, I'm not complaining because I, you know, uh, as whoever I really am, if, if, because I don't have something, it's because, you know, women, people of color, LGBTQ plus people don't have you know, what they deserve or what they have the rights to. So, um, it, you know, my complaints can't be personalized. Um, it would be really interesting, you know, to imagine what, what it would be like. I mean, these masks are a little problematic because at the time when we took them, we thought, oh, we're gonna dispel, you know, all of the stereotypes about gorillas, uh, um, all the racial stereotypes about gorillas. We were gonna, you know, destroy the, you know, all the stereotypes about feminists. Um, it hasn't really worked out that way. Um, so I, you know, I don't know what more to say. I think that if we were, again, if we were to start over again, we might have different strategy, different identity strategies, but different identity strategies. Uh, um, here's another one. Carl Hill. Carl wants to know, was there any inspiration that Larry Kramer, ACT UP, provided for your work? Oh, of course. I mean, ACT UP was great and Grand Fury and, um, you know, general idea. There were so many wonderful artists, um, you know, collectives that were doing great, great work. And what was, you know, terrific about ACT UP was just you know, they were ferocious. They were just, you know, unstoppable. And, you know, they were just, and, and it was a life or death situation. And that was the kind of wonderful and tragic, you know, part of it. They were, they were fighting for their lives. Um, and there was just such a necessity and an urgency to it all. And I remember seeing the buses come by with, you know, kissing don't kill, doesn't kill, AIDS does, or no, um, uh, what was the second line? Kissing doesn't kill, um, cruelty, you know, it was just spectacular. It was, you know, it, I really think that's the kind of transformative messaging that really changed the culture's attitude. Um, you know, towards AIDS and, uh, and gay rights. And there's a long one here from Laura Sue, who says she's been following your work for since 1985 and has tried to do versions of it in Syracuse where she lived at the time, but haven't seen the most or most recent work that's been shown here. And it's great to see um, where the where uh, great to see so where is the best place uh, to follow your work now? What is the website? Uh, www.gorillagirls.com. Two R's, two L's in gorilla. Yeah, so we that have... is definitely the best place to see the work because, as you've told us, the work is digital, so it works well on the web, and uh, and there it is now in the chat, so that people can can see it and copy it and, and go to the site. Can you buy the book there? Yes, you can buy the book there or you can buy it from your favorite independent bookseller. And also so all the other nasty ones, but I won't. I <laughs> all the people that you would be protesting right now. You know, all the people who hire none, you know, won't allow their employees to union us. <laughs> <laughs> 
So if you had a message for pride, what would it be? Be proud, be proud. Don't give up one inch. Don't give up one inch. Just, you know, have fun, show what, uh, what a, a real full life is as, you know, as an LGBTQ plus person uh, and just, you know, fight the power, fight the power because you know you're on the right side of history. I mean, that gives, that gives us, that gave us so much ammunition to know that we were, we were correct. We were accurate. You know, we knew something that we had to educate the rest of the art world about. I mean, we didn't know what it all was at the beginning. We just started asking questions and one thing led to another. And, and you know, every year we had a better understanding you know, of how the art world functions to eliminate um, you know, so many people. So um, just take strength that you're on the right side of history, no matter what, and that um, so, so much of our governmental structures at the state and even the national level are, are, are sliding backwards. You know, the straight white guys, you know, are so afraid of losing power that they're doing everything, you know, uh, to hold on to it, even if it is inventing a minority, you know, a minority elected government, which is shocking and, you know, and frightening. Uh, we really all have to realize that that's what's happening and we have to fight it. And Mikhail, Michaela posted, AIDS bus poster, kissing doesn't kill, greed and indifference do. That's it, yes, thank you, greed and indifference do. Thank you, thank you. I, I'm, I'm glad, thank you, Michaela, for, for posting that. Um, and Gary said, thank you for all you do. You're, you are trailblazers and so important for our society to hear. Uh, there's another interesting thing, since we have only a little time left, but your work has transcended many, many different subject matters and focused on many different people in power. And interestingly, uh, you know, back when you started the, in the LGBTQ community, it was white male focused. And now uh, there's a big focus on, on trans and, and, and especially um, black trans women. And, and their safety and how everybody is not treated equally. Uh, and they become a symbol for the rest of the community in terms of if they don't have their rights, then our rights aren't necessarily respected as well. Has, have you felt that that, trans, that transformation uh, has impacted other things besides just the LGBTQ community. Uh, yes, but again, we're all in this together and we really need to um, collaborate with each other to find ways of speaking with each other to, um, to not see each other as enemies, but as, uh, you know, as allies. And we might not all get it right the first time or the very beginning. Uh, and we need patience with each other um, to realize that we, you know, we may have different ways to get to the same place, but, um, you know, there, you have to attack a problem from all sides, from, the, you know, from, you know, forward, backwards, up, down, right side, left side, whatever. Um, we, we, and again, everything is evolving. We, I look back at some of our early languages we talked before we started, you know, the words that we used to describe things, you know, 30 years ago, just seem weird, the word minorities, that's so offensive. Uh, and, uh, you know, now, you know, using the word black rather than African-American and white, you know, capitalized um, is, you know, it, it's important. Uh, and and we're, we're never perfect because it's gonna change. 10 years from now, we're gonna look back at this time and, you know, uh, you know gender and, and racial um, issues are gonna have a whole different and a lot more information. Um, so when we look back, we have to look back with, with a little bit of patience, I think. Well, thank you very much. This has been great fun and as someone like some of the other people here who have watched the work for decades, uh, it's exciting to know that you're not only out there still, but 
doing the most important kind of work, which is making everybody else aware of what they can do. So once again, I ask those of you who are on the call um, on Zoom or in Facebook to please consider supporting us at Stonewall. Uh, you can get your membership at the website or even probably go right through Facebook and do it and uh, get the book, get active and be out there for pride because everybody needs to march because the more people who are out there, the more they will know how serious we are. And please consider inviting someone to march with you or to enjoy the spectacle with you who's never been before. The more, as, as Frida said, the more we can build allies, the more we can build relationships, the better it is for all of us. So thank you all. Have a good night. You can find this on the Stonewall YouTube channel. Have a good night. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great privilege to be here. Thank you so much.